before we begin, let me pray. Dear gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you teach us um, and you train us in all righteousness in your word. I pray that you would please show us of what this good life is living as followers of Jesus um, today. Lord, as we read, I pray that you would give us soft hearts and help us listen. Um, yeah, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 15. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Thank you, Abby. Our friends, we're continuing our, um, new, our new series on church called The Dearest Place on Earth. Uh, we're looking at what God thinks about the church because that really matters for us because it really reshapes everything about the way we live as Christians. If you're not yet a believer, it's so great that you're here with us today um, and you're seeking out and you're learning. And I hope that you'll see as we build a picture of church that it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's not perfect, as we'll see today. Uh, but it is at the center of all that God is doing in this world. Now, friends, um, I just want to share with you a little bit about me coming to church. And I actually grew up in this church, if you don't know that. I grew up in the sense of I was here in the formative years of my Christian life around uni. So I sort of joined the church around 2003 through YF. YF was around back then. And I used to come along to the Bible studies and things like that. But let's, let, let me just say um, I wasn't exactly the, um, the best person to have in YF. I think I was a bit of a headache for my YF leaders. Um, let me give you a bit of flashback to what, uh, this is YF, this is a bit of a fresh face. You might recognize a few faces there. Um, there's a bit of a flashback from our YF camps. I still look the same, don't I? More wrinkles, a few more wrinkles, a bit more stress lines. Uh, so, you know, I, I used to love YF, um, but I, I think I was a bit of a I caused a bit of trouble for my YF leaders because this is the sort of guy that I was. I used to, YF used to be on Saturday nights. Um, I might take this down, actually. I think everyone's uh, <laughs> a bit too distracted by it. So I just wanted to show you what I used to look like. Uh, so YF used to be on Saturday nights, late Saturday nights out at SLE. Um, and this is what I used to do sometimes. I used to rock up to YF. I used to do the Bible study. And then I'll head straight from Bible study into the city to go clubbing and trying to get drunk. Like, and everyone knew that because I came dressed in full, like, you know, <laughs> I wasn't trying to hide it or anything. And I think the leaders, they didn't really know what to do with me in one sense. Uh, I, that was the sort of Christian I was. I was, in one sense, a fake Christian, you know, saying one thing, living the other. And I remember I used to look at the leaders in YF, some of who are here. I used to look at the leaders in YF, and I used to turn to my friends, some of my other friends, the ones that used to come clubbing with me, and I used to say to them, Look at these guys, man. Can, make me a promise, all right? Promise me we'll never be like that, okay? Can, 
probably they take things way too seriously. Look at that. They, you know, they, 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 they follow all the rules. They're always telling us what we should do and shouldn't do. Um, they promise me we'll never, ever be like that. That's what I used to say. Well, God's got a sense of humor because both of us are pastors now. Uh, so <laughs> God's got a bit of a sense of humor there. But I wonder sometimes if that's how you look at me now. Or you might look at others in the church like that. And you might look at us and you might go, yeah, yeah, it's cool to be Christian, but not that Christian, right? You don't want to be that Christian, yeah? You don't want to be that uncool sort of Christian, like the Ned Flanders sort of Christian who's just like really geeky, who just like is caught up in following all the rules, doing all the right things, never says a bad a swear word out of their mouth. Um, you know, the legalistic type that's always going on about what you should do and shouldn't do, and they're so caught up in this sort of stuff. And maybe, actually, these sorts of Christians, um, they're not just uncool, they're, maybe they've missed the bigger point, because isn't the gospel about grace, right? Why are you going on about commands? Why are you going on about all the things that you should do? What's holy and what's not? You've forgotten grace. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be this judgmental, legalistic person. So it means that, I think, in the modern church, we've sort of downplayed holiness a little bit. We sort of go, we, we want to be Christian, but not that Christian. Friends, today I want to show you something really important. I want to show you that holiness really, really matters to God. It really matters to God. It matters so much because this is what he saved his church to be. If God thinks this important, we better take notice here, friends. This is really important for us. And I'm going to, to, in today's message, I'm going to give two reasons why holiness really matters. And I hope they'll reframe how we think about holiness. And also then we'll get into some more practical points about what it means to be holy together as a church. Now, before we start, I want to say something to those of you amongst us who are really struggling with sin at the moment. Um, and I know there's bound to be people here who are in that, that you just are really weighed down by sin at the moment. You're feeling really guilty, really weighed down, really burdened by sin. And as we talk about holiness, there's the, the risk that there's, it's just going to crush you more and more. I want to say to you today that you need to remember large in your mind the grace of God. I want you to remember Romans 8 verse 1, that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Because he's defeated sin, right? Sin cannot accuse you anymore, okay? I just want to encourage you to keep grace large in your mind as we go along. And I want you to see today that you aren't alone, okay? You aren't alone. We're in this together. That's what it means to be a holy church together. So I just want to say that before we start. But let's get on to our first point. Holiness matters because that's why you were saved, okay? Holiness matters because that's why you were saved. Here's the first reason. Um, the word holy actually occurs more than 600 times in the Bible. More than 800 if you count all the derivative things like holiness, sanctification, things like that. That tells you something, doesn't it? This is really important. This is really important. But what does holiness mean? At its most basic meaning, it means separation. It means to be set apart. It means to be different, unique, special. Okay, that's what holiness means. And particularly when you think about uh, the fact that we call God holy, he's the ultimate example of that. He's completely set apart, transcendent, so far beyond us. There's creator and then everything else, creation. Okay, that's what it means to be holy, set apart, different, special. And here's the thing, as we think about God as the holy God, our holy God, we as his people are called to reflect that. We're called to be holy. We're called to be holy. And this is at the center of God's plans, that we should be special, set apart, that we should be different, we should reflect his, who He is. Now, if I was to ask you today, why did Jesus die? I wonder what you would say to that. You might say something like, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, and He rose again to give me new life, to give my sins, so we can be forgiven, right? Right? Yeah, and that's a great answer. Great. I hope you all have that answer in your head. But if that's all you said, then you're actually only seeing half the picture. I wonder if you realize that. Uh, we're going to start by actually looking at Titus 2. We'll get back to that Ephesians passage a bit later. You can turn to Titus 2 if you want. Otherwise, it'll be coming up on the screen. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Titus 2, verse 11. Otherwise, it'll be popping up on the screen. Let me read this to you. Okay. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Now, I love this passage. It's all about God's grace. 
just centered on God's grace, this free gift of God, right? This generosity of God. And verse 11 tells us something first, that grace has appeared, right? Personified in Jesus Christ. And what has it done? Well, it's brought salvation, right? It's brought salvation for all people. That's the good news. That's grace. But that's not all, is it? What else does grace do? Grace has also come in verse 12 to do what? It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace trains us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Do you see the, these two things that grace does equally? In theological terms, we would say that uh, God's grace not only justifies us, declares us to be right with God, but it also sanctifies us, makes us holy. It justifies us, and it sanctifies us. In other words, we aren't just saved from sin. We are saved for holiness. Let me say that, say that again. We aren't just saved from sin. We are saved for holiness. We keep going on. Verse 13, Titus 2. This is what comes up. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Keeps going on, keeps building this picture, right? Christ died so you can be holy. That's why Christ died, so you can be holy, so we can be holy. He gave himself up for us, why? To redeem us from sin and to purify for himself a holy people. Now imagine if you had an opportunity, if you found out there was someone in slavery, and modern day slavery still exists, friends, let me tell you this, International Justice Mission is an organization that helps here, if you're interested, we support them as a church, but imagine if you had an opportunity to actually free someone from slavery, you found someone was in slavery, and you went to the person who owned the slave, and then you said, how much does it take to free this person? And they give you an amount, you know, $10,000 or something. So you, you work hard, you raise that money, and then you go over, you fly overseas, um, and you, you give this money to the slave owner, and he gives you the key. Then you walk into this back room, this dingy back room, and there you see this poor man locked up in chains. You take the key, you unlock the shackles from around his wrists, around his legs, and you look into his eyes and you say, you're free now, you're free now. And then you fly back home to, to Australia, you go, yes, great, you know, it's, it's, it's been done, that slave is free. Uh, but then you found out one month later that he's still there, living in the same house, doing exactly the same things, stuck in his old ways, still serving that master, just without his chains on anymore. What would you be thinking? <laughs> You'd be so sad about that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't be happy with that. You'd be saying, I freed you. You know, I paid for that. Yeah, I've got, there's so much more for you. There's a, there's a new life ahead. There's a greater purpose here. I haven't freed you just to stay there. There's something more. And that's the purpose that Jesus frees us for as well. Think about this. Jesus has broken the chains of slavery that were put on us by sin, right? He's redeemed us. That's what redeemed means, to pay for someone to come out of slavery. He's redeemed us. We're free from the penalty of sin and death. But Jesus, our Lord and Savior, He doesn't want us to still sit in our sin. He doesn't want us to still be slaves to our old lives, living the same way we were before. He's got a brand new life for us, a better life, a greater purpose. And that life is holiness, righteousness, godliness. That's what He's got for us. And so much better than the old way. Friends, we need to see this, right? We, we see it as a burden. We see it as like, here's a bunch of rules I have to follow. No, this is the beautiful life, okay? This is the ways of God. Right? And you remember Ephesians 5 that we looked at in our first sermon, that beautiful passage about Jesus who is a husband who loves his bride so much that he dies for her? Well, remember the purpose. He dies for his bride to purify her, sanctify her, to make her holy and blameless. He dies for her bride to make her beautiful. Holiness is a beautiful thing, and that's what we were saved for. We aren't just saved from sin. We are saved for holiness, friends. We need to understand that. Friends, you don't belong to sin anymore. You are free. 
Holiness really matters because that's why you were saved. And here's the second reason holiness matters. Holiness matters because this is who you are. The Bible gives us many motivations to live for holiness. If there's a really great book called The Hole in Our Holiness by Kevin DeYoung, um, and he lists all the reasons of the scriptures have to, for us to be holy. There are so many. <laughs> there's like, I think there's like 50 or something. There's a lot of reasons. But I think one of the primary ones, one of the biggest ones that comes up the most often is actually your identity. Your identity. Let me ask you a question. If I was to ask you today, maybe this should have been the discussion question, but it's very complex and philosophical. If I ask you, who are you? I wonder what you'd say. Who are you? Maybe I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, what have you got on your Instagram bio that describes who you are? That'd be really interesting to find out. I've stopped using Instagram because it's too distracting for me, but I think I had something like this. Um, husband, father, pastor, something like that, you know? And however you see yourself, right, your identity will shape how you live, right? How you see yourself shapes how you live. Uh, let me take the father identity, uh, which is a huge part of who I am. You know, when I had kids, I became a father. Uh, this isn't sort of an optional thing. It just happens. You become a father. That's your identity. Uh, but this isn't just a title. It changes your life. I needed to now live out who I am. I can't, which it means this, when I took on the title of identity, uh, the title of father, sorry, that, that becomes my new identity, it means I can't just sleep in every morning anymore, yeah? Parents, you know what I'm talking about? You can't just sleep in for as late as you want, because guess what? There's children that need food, and uh, grumpy, and might, might hurt themselves if they wander around the house without supervision. So you need to get up, you need to help them. It also means this, it, it means you've got to eat last now. Because there's children, uh, I've got quite a few kids that need food, and it takes a while, you've got to eat last, otherwise they'll get grumpy. It means I had to stop being so selfish, because I had to think of others and how to love them, right? The needs of the little ones under my care. My identity as a father reshaped how I live. How you see yourself actually reshapes how you live. And brothers and sisters, your new identity in Christ has to reshape how you live because this is who you are now. I want to point out especially to what our corporate identity is as a church. I'm going to, we're going to go to 1 Peter for this, a passage we've looked at before, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Who are you? Well, what does God tell you? He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This isn't who you are going to be. This is who you are right now. This is what it means to be God's church. This tells us something. <clears throat> In one sense... As we strive for holiness, we're already holy. We're already holy. Here in 1 Peter says, you are a holy nation right now. Hebrews 10 tells us we've already been sanctified because Christ has died for his church. He's redeemed his church already. We've already been set apart. We've already been forgiven. We've already been made special, right? We've become his precious, beloved possession already. He's made us holy already. Christ's death and resurrection has done that. Church, we need to understand something. We are His holy church. We are His holy church. So let's live like it. Let's live like it. We need to be convinced of who we are in Christ. We need to be convinced of that. Because this will keep us going even when things are hard. I think we all know that church is imperfect. We all know that we're imperfect and we, we are the church. So it's bound to be imperfect. We're all works in progress. The power of sin has been broken, but the presence of sin still remains. Which means that this holiness thing, this, it's day by day, every single day. It's a, it's a struggle, it's a, it's a grind, it's a fight to put off sin, to put on righteousness. But when you're losing hope, when you wonder, is this even possible? Remember who you are. Remember what Christ has won for you, your new identity. Remember that you are God's holy people. And let that identity drive you. 
And friends, the wonderful thing about that is inherent to this identity. Think about this. It's the fact that you aren't alone. You aren't alone. Now, point three. Holiness takes a team effort. <clears throat> so we looked at two of the scriptural foundations of why holiness matters, but I want to get a bit practical now and see how the church feeds into this. Right? I want to start by saying that the only way that we become holy ultimately is by the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, work in our hearts to make us holy. Right? That's the only way. It doesn't come by more effort, trying harder. It, that, that doesn't work. But I do believe that God has a special role for His church and His people to actually take part in this holiness project together. Okay? Let's have a look at Ephesians 5 now. And, now, and how holiness plays out in the life of the Ephesian church here as the Apostle Paul talks to them. Ephesians 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This is a sobering passage. The first thing we actually see is that holiness is very serious. It's very serious in the church. And note the sins that are being highlighted here. I thought this was really interesting. Verse 3 and repeated in verse 4. The, I've highlighted them there. Um, they're um, repeated twice, so it must be really important. They're actually sins focused on sex and money. Sex and money, all right? Uh, the same sins that we're still struggling with today, aren't we? The sins that tear apart churches, tear apart God's people over and over. These good gifts of God, actually, sex and money, that are twisted and made into idols, when the church loves sex and money more than Jesus, it's deadly serious. And verse 5 is a fearsome verse. Have a look at verse 5 with me. It's a fierce, fearsome verse. For you know everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. No inheritance. We need to feel the weight of this. I don't want us to read that and just move on and say, it's all good, we're okay. I want us to feel the weight of this. We need to take holiness seriously because judgment is deadly serious. It's serious. Friends, this is a matter of heaven and hell. This is a matter of life and death. This is about eternity. This is about eternity. Now, what it's talking about here, it isn't talking about individual acts of sin that we fall into we've already noted that we're still works in progress and unfortunately we will fall and stumble at times don't worry that's not enough to disqualify you as member members of god's holy church you know christ's death and resurrection it's stronger than that you know uh, his death and resurrection overcomes that but what it's talking about here is just a lifestyle of unrepentant sin if this is what characterizes who you are it means living in sin and not caring and not wanting to turn back to Jesus Christ. These are the people that have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. And isn't that the last thing we want to see for anyone? That's the last thing we want to see for anyone. Brothers and sisters, it should break our hearts when we see people in sin. It should really break our hearts. It, when, we, when we see people not walking in a way that matches up with their identity as God's holy people... It shouldn't be judgment that comes. It should be sadness and grieving. It should break our hearts because God grieves this. It breaks our heart. It should break our heart to see people living in sin, turning away from Jesus and destroying their lives, you know, because that's how God feels. That's how we should feel as well, which means this. Sin is not something we can just sweep under the rug. We can't just pretend it's okay. We can't just try and keep a semblance of everything is fine here, don't worry about it, we're all good. This is serious. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of eternity. When we see sin staining God's holy church, we need to do something about it. 
The Ephesian passage here is telling us to do whatever it takes to get rid of sin in the church. Fight. Fight to be holy. And this is something we need to do together as a church. Together. So how do we do that? Well, I'm just going to quickly give you three things. Each one of these could be a sermon in and of itself, so I'm just going to run through them quickly. Um, But the first is this. Let's get practical. Confession. Confession. (coughs) Now, confession primarily is you and God, okay? You confessing your sins to God. Uh, But I think confessing to one another is also really important. I'm not going to overemphasize this because the Bible doesn't have that many scriptures on it, to be honest, but it does come up. Uh, James 5, 16 talks about this. Uh, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I think the one another confession is that it acknowledges something. It says that you can't do it alone, right? That part of being a church is that we need each other. God has put us here to encourage one another, to spur one another on, all right? To, to, To love and good deeds. You know, it's not a solo sport. Fighting sin alone and you might feel like this. Fighting sin alone is like trying to push a boulder uphill by yourself, right? It's almost an impossible task. It continually is threatening to rush back down and crush you. But what if you had some people helping you do that? What if you had one more person by your side? Two, three, five, ten, twenty. Helping you push, fight, grind it out, struggle. It makes all the difference. But this can only come if you tell people you need help. How can people help if they don't know? Confession, I know, it takes great courage. It takes courage. It takes strength to be vulnerable, to acknowledge that you need help, especially when that sin is a shameful one, right? A a shameful sin. You've got sort of like respectable sins, then you've got sins that you never want to talk about. And let me talk about porn for just a minute. (coughs) I think... It's the number one killer of holiness in the church today for both young men and women, right? It affects both genders equally. One of the reasons is that it's a shameful thing. It's a secret thing. No one wants to talk about porn. Who wants to talk about it? But let me tell you something. If you ever want to make progress here, you need to bring it out of the darkness and bring it into the light. You need to bring it into the light. It loves the dark. Porn loves the dark. Sexual sin loves the darkness. Let me share with you a bit about my story. I first got exposed to porn when I was in, I think in primary school, grade six, maybe. Parents, you've got to be on the front foot about this with your kids having this conversation. And ever since then, it's been a struggle for me. Ever since then, for as long as I remember. It's always threatening to get me, to tempt me, that lust, that sexual sin. But you know what the turning point in my battle was? It was when I brought it out of the dark is when I actually talked to someone about it. When I got Covenant Eyes, uh, accountability software for all my devices, so that I've got accountability partners that uh, check, check on me. They can see whatever I'm doing online. That was a game changer. When I invited trusted friends in my life to actually check in on me, gave them permission to do that, asked them to ask me the hard questions, that was a game changer. You know, that's when I saw God really begin to break the back of that sin for me. You know, if I kept trying to do it alone, I'd don't think I'd be here right now. I think, yeah, I can honestly say that. I needed others to help. And that can only happen when you bring it out of the darkness into the light. Friends, we need each other. We need each other. Whatever sin you're struggling with, know this. You aren't alone. You aren't alone. God's given the church to help one another. Holiness, it's a group project. It's a team effort. Can, that's confession. Let's move on to rebuke. Rebuke. This means essentially confronting someone about their sin with a goal to help them turn back to Jesus. Now, this is something that comes up a lot in scriptures, actually, a lot. But let me just give you a really simple, concise teaching from our Lord Jesus Christ himself from Luke 17, verse 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents... Forgive him. Doesn't get clearer than that, does it? (laughs) Really straightforward. But we don't do it, do we? Why not? I'll give you two reasons why we don't do it. Um, Number one, we hate confrontation. Who here loves confrontation? It's hard work, right? 
having those hard conversations. We hate confrontation. No one likes it. And number two, we don't want to be judgmental. We don't want to be this Pharisee who's like pointing out people's sins, you know, coming down hard on people. And because of those two things, we run away from rebuke, right? We run as far as we can from it. But let me tell you something. Let me, let me give you a principle that will help you overcome these things, all right? A simple principle, okay? Are you ready? It's this. It's love. It's love. If we want to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, the most loving thing we can do is to help them walk with Jesus, isn't it? It's to keep helping them walk a holy life as Jesus has called them to. How can we, how can we stand by and let people walk down the path of destruction, away from Jesus and towards sin, and be okay with that? If we truly love our brothers and sisters, friends, it should drive us. Rebuke doesn't feel nice, but the alternative is infinitely more serious to just let it be, letting people walk away from Jesus. Friends, let's love our brothers and sisters. Please keep love in your mind as you think about this hard thing of rebuke. And I want to say, if you're on the receiving end, if someone comes to you and points it out, um, something that you might, a sin that you might be in, then I'll ask you to be humbly taking a step back. I know it's hard. And also recognizing that this person is saying it because of love, right? If they didn't care, they wouldn't say anything. <laughs> it's much easier to run away. So I'll ask for you to be gracious as well. I know that's hard, friends, but I want us to be thinking about love driving us. Now, I'll take a full workshop to really think about how to do this well, but I'm going to give you three quick principles, okay, about rebuke. Number one is say something, okay? Just say something, yeah. If you say nothing, if someone's in sin um, and you say nothing, you're essentially saying something. You're saying, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's cool, yeah. Uh, that silence is actually affirmation, friends. If your friend starts dating a non-Christian, has begun getting drunk every weekend, has stopped going to church or life group because they're just working all the time, say something, please. Please. Yeah. That's the first principle. And number two is as you do that, be gracious. Don't assume that you know everything about their situation, what's going on in their life, what's causing these things. Go in there to understand and love them, all right? Not to condemn. Don't assume anything. And go in there realizing that you too are a sinner. Go in there humble, but be gracious to them as you do that. And number three is this. Point them to Jesus. The worst rebuke that can happen is if you come in hard and you just go, here's your sin, man. Better pull up your socks and fix it up. See you later. Uh, that's not loving, is it? The aim has always got to be to point them back to Jesus. Point them back to the fact that Jesus holds out forgiveness and grace to all who come to him. That even no matter how bad their sin, no matter how stuck they are in the sin, that Jesus has forgiveness waiting for them. All right? And keep pointing them back to that and pointing them to the fact that Jesus has saved them from sin and saved them for holiness, okay? Make sure you end with Jesus. Let me tell you something. Even if you do it as best as you can, people don't always respond well. But that's okay. That's okay. That's not up to you. Trust God, okay? You do what you can as a brother or sister in Christ to help someone and then leave the rest to God, okay? Rebuke. It is important. And the last one, church discipline. Okay? Church discipline. Now, this is something we really do not like to talk about, right? But I'm going to briefly go here because it's really important. Let me tell you, this one, it comes up a lot, actually, in scriptures. Um, I'm going to show you what Jesus says about it from Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, this is serious stuff. Because holiness is serious to God. Remember that, friends. This is the final resort. You'll see this is the final result. In the case of serious, unrepentant sin, the church has to step in. Uh, the pastors and the elders are entrusted with this responsibility to actually step in. 
But once again, it's stepping in in love. Firstly, to love the church. You know, the, this leaders step in to exercise church discipline to protect the wider flock from sin spreading and influencing others. But also, it's loving that person in sin, isn't it? By showing them how serious sin is and taking and trying to help them take the steps to lead them to repentance. It's love that drives it as well. Do you notice the end point in verse 17? Jesus says, uh, let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, what's that mean? Well, Gentiles and tax collectors, they were the people who, uh, I guess, were uh, enemies in one sense, right? Yeah, they were apart, separate, you know, people disliked them, didn't... I don't think Jesus is saying here, though, to shun these people, right? He's not saying cut them off, have nothing to do with them, despise these people. Of course, there will be things that, you know, if members sin and they're um, stepped down, uh, disciplined, they may be excluded from some things for the safety of the flock. But I think Jesus, when you think about it, how does he treat Gentiles? How does he treat tax collectors? Doesn't he have a tax collector as one of his disciples? I think what Jesus is saying here is that you need to reach out grace, uh, hold grace out to them. Yeah. You need to preach the gospel to them. You need to actually win them back. Yeah, call them to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And you don't do that by hating them. You do that by loving them. That's what, it's, that's what he's calling us to. Calling people to repent and believe. That's what Jesus wants. Friend, holiness, it really really matters to God. But we need to realize something. It's a team effort. This thing here that we call church, it's here for a reason, right? There's a reason that we don't just stay at home and stream a sermon every week and listen to whatever music we feel like on our Spotify playlist and call that church. We need to do this church thing together because we need to help each other walk with Jesus. We need each other if we want to live out our calling as God's holy church. So let's do that, friends. We need to do it together. And let me finish with this one point, which is really, really important. Remember God's grace. <clears throat> As we finish up, I just want to give, you a, give us a reminder. <clears throat> we are a holy church, but we won't be a perfect church until Jesus Christ returns and takes us home. This is really important for us to note. I think it's important for us to note that because it helps us have the right expectation of church every time we walk in through those doors. We need to have some expectations in our mind that church will be messy. Right? It won't be perfect. There will be conflict at times. There will be some relational breakdown at times. There will be people that might even hurt me. There will definitely be people that disappoint me in this church. Living in community is hard because guess what? It's a bunch of people who are all sinners living together. Forgiven sinners, but still sinners, nonetheless. But let me tell you, the solution is not to withdraw. It's not to move on and find another church. It's not to move on and forget all about this. We're called to live together as a people of grace every day. And we're called to keep loving each other, even though it's hard. Ephesians 4, verse 1 says this, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, what? Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why do we need to be told to bear with one another in love? That particular word, bear with one another in love? It's because it's hard work. It's hard work. This should be our expectation. It's hard work because we're all works in progress, still battling sin. We're all still in need of grace. My first reaction when someone wrongs me, when someone sins against me, is to be angry, upset, disappointed. It's to complain, normally to my wife, Lee Ching. It's to get self-righteous as well. You know, I'll, how, how could they do that? I'll never do that. But when I calm down and look at things, um, I can actually reflect and go, well, I'm just as much as a sinner as that person. And I know I'm more than capable of doing what they did, of saying those hurtful, harmful things. In fact, I've done it before. And I'm more, and I'm just as much in need of grace 
as they are. But praise God, because he's the one that shows all of us grace and forgiveness in Christ Jesus through his death and resurrection on the cross. And this is the grace that fuels us to be people of grace, people of grace continually. Friends, in the end, how do we live as a holy church, striving for holiness, yet fighting sin and bearing with one another in love as we make mistakes along the way? How on earth are we supposed to do that? Well, there's only one way, and that's to be transformed by God's grace. To keep remembering the cross. To keep remembering our Lord and Savior Jesus, what he's done for us, what he's given to us, that forgiveness, that mercy, and that love. And as we keep gazing at the cross and remembering what we've been saved from and what we've been saved to, that grace, it can transform our hearts. Soak in this wonderful gift. Let grace transform you. Let me pray. Father God, we um, thank you. We're just so thankful for your grace and mercy in Christ that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is love. We thank you that you loved us, your beloved church, so much that Jesus would do such a thing for us, that he would sacrifice his very life to win us not just from sin, but to holiness. We pray that you will empower us by your Holy Spirit to live a life that reflects this new identity that we have, a life of holiness, a life of godliness, a life of Christ-likeness to your glory. And we pray that we as a church may understand that we need each other for this. May we be bold and courageous to confess sins to one another, to rebuke when needed, to be honest and open and to be gracious to one another as these sins come up. Father, help us because we know We are imperfect. We need your help. And we thank you for your promise that you will help us if we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our friends, I'd love for you to just keep...